good afternoon. I am pleased and uh, honored to welcome you all uh, to this international conference, Islam and the West, Islam in the West, which uh, celebrates the publication of Professor Uri Ashavit's uh, three books, Islamism and the West, published by Rutledge, uh, Sharia and Muslim Minorities, published by Oxford University Press, and Zionism in Arab Discourses, published by Manchester University Press. Most impressive, I am sure. Um, our first session is dedicated to Islam, Islamism, and the West. We are about to hear uh, lectures by scholars specializing in the current Islamic discourse as reflected in the writings of some uh, Muslim intellectuals who wrote in Arabic. Um, we begin with a keynote lecture which will be delivered by Professor Itzhak Weissman. Itzhak Weissman is a professor of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at Haifa University and former head of the Jewish Arab Center at the university. He specializes in the study of Islamic movements, the history of modern Syria, Sufism, and Islam in the Indian subcontinent. The most recent among his numerous publications in this field is a biography on Abdul Rahman Al Kawakibi. Professor Weissman will talk to us today about the dual dialectics of the Islamic Enlightenment. Please. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I want to join congratulations to uh, Uriah Shavit, uh, celebrating three books uh, together. That's really a festival. Uh, and it's a good occasion to meet all of us. Uh, and I'm honored to, give the, uh, to open this, uh, this conference. Um, actually, on Islam in Europe, uh, I don't work much. I leave this to my uh, PhD student, Ziv, who is here. Also, Dina uh, worked with me a little bit about it. But uh, I share with Uya uh, the topic uh, of uh, the encounters between Islam and the West at the early modern period in the late 19th century, early uh, 20th century. And uh, the question I want to address now uh, is really the connection between these early, uh, very liberal, uh, open group of uh, Islamic intellectuals uh, who were ready to accommodate much of the West and what we all uh, unfortunately witnessed in the past few years, uh, maybe from the beginning of the millennium and especially in the last uh, two years, all the atrocities, the barbarities. How comes that uh, this encounter that started uh, with openness, with a liberal eye, became such, uh, or fell into such an abyss of barbarity? Of course, not all Muslims, but uh, uh, still, I want to check the, or to examine this connection between early. Uh, reformers and today so-called jihadist, Salafi jihadist um, of Al-Qaeda and especially uh, ISIS. To examine this question, uh, well, uh, it came to my mind, especially when I was invited to the talk, like all of us, uh, we are exposed to all these pictures of what ISIS is doing. And it came to mind that I think when I talk with people, many concur that sometimes it's really like, like the Nazis. Right? Some of the things that we see, some of the pictures, uh, this uh, uh, really the bottom of inhumanity really resembles uh, in many ways uh, uh, the Nazis. And it occurred to me maybe to try to uh, 
understand, or try to understand a little bit what happens here, is to go back maybe to uh, uh, scholars from, this, from these times. And that's what stands behind my, uh, the title of my talk, which is derived from a book that is called Dialectics of Enlightenment, a book that uh, appeared in 1944 and uh, was uh, uh, written by uh, Adorno and Orkheimer, uh, two leading figures of the Frankfurt School. So <coughs> just a few words on this, uh, uh, on this group. The Frankfurt School uh, is a group of intellectuals, uh, most of them Jewish, who uh, were gathered around the Institute for Social Research in Frankfurt University in the 30s. In the 40s, they were already in the United States, heard about the Holocaust, and tried to cope with it. They came from a, a Marxist background, yeah, but uh, they tried to learn also from other disciplines, new disciplines, especially psychoanalysis and uh, the teachings of Freud. What they developed, uh, they called critical theory uh, that uh, was composed of uh, interdisciplinarity using Marxist history, Marxist theory, but also the other things, and the involvement, they believe in the involvement, intellectual involvement of the uh, um, of scholars, of social uh, science, uh, science scholars in the affairs of the time. But what's mo what is most important, uh, and this I will focus here, is their uh, uh, teaching about the critique of reason. Yeah? The critique of reason. Uh, just to show, this is the Frankfurt School. Some of the figures you may know, Walter Benjamin, who is now one of the uh, uh, inspirers of postmodernic thought, Herbert Marcuse, uh, the bottom line, was involved in the student, uh, um, student uh, uh, affairs of the 1968, and, and others. But what do I mean by critique of reason? Or more uh, correctly, what they, do they uh, thought is the critique of reason? They called it the dialectics of enlightenment. Enlightenment for them was uh, well the classical uh, movement of the 18th century, the uh, definition of Kant and others as the liberation from the chains of tradition through the use of uh, reason. And this brought the uh, ideas that many of us, all of us, I hope, believe in the idea of freedom, freedom of choice, freedom of speech, science uh, to promote society, social solidarity, which later developed into nationalism, and in uh, capital P, maybe the whole issue of progress. There, uh, this concept of enlightenment built on previous movements of the Renaissance, of humanism, of the Reformation in Europe, and what was added by the uh, leader of the second generation of Frankfurt School, one of the prominent philosophers of our time, Habermas, on the question of the bourgeois public sphere, the group, the middle class that leads these things, and uh, the public sphere where it is spread. But according to the Frankfurt School, uh, who tried to explain the rise of totalitarianism, okay, so fascism, uh, well, many tended to think that this is something that came out of the Enlightenment and disrupts it. It's something that challenges uh, the Enlightenment. The Frankfurt School said, no, this is something inside, inside the Enlightenment, something with rationality is wrong and uh, brings to this um, these results. To make it very brief, that's a very complex teaching, but they say, they said uh, rationalism was uh, accompanied from the beginning with mythology, which meant to give 
uh, order to uh, the chaos of the world. This led uh, the myth which brings to control of man, of nature, control of himself. Uh, this brings to alienation of man. Uh, this alienation uh, brings later to separation. And this happened in modern times between the cultural progress and material progress. You can progress materially, but remain backward uh, culturally. In the, this process of separation, of alienation, uh, there is, emerges the allure of regression to primitive condition, uh, to barbarity, to loss of reason, and to absorption of the individual in state and in society, all the collective and totalitarian system. Put it very briefly, but I will connect it soon to uh, the Islamic, uh, the Islamic topic. There was much critique on the Frankfurt School, uh, critique of critical theory. They were very elitist. They saw that uh, totalitarianism is not only in fascist, in, in fascism, Nazism, but also in mass culture. Yes, they didn't uh, s uh, distinguish between coercion and temptation. They were very pessimist. The dialectic was negative. Always something good brings something bad. Uh, they forgot about human agency. They, were, they suffered from lack of historicity. Yeah. Uh, they talked about uh, nightmare something that always exists. We will uh, emphasize the external conditions when we talk about Islamic enlightenment. They saw no way to resistance to these processes. There's nothing to do about it. To this, uh, Foucault answered one of their uh, successors. Uh, he said that wherever there is power, there is also resistance. So it's important to remember it. And for the Frankfurt School, there was no place for religion in the public sphere. This is something that Habermas started to correct only in the 1990s in the wake of the Islamic revival. And Muslim, uh, the, the rise of Muslim population in uh, Europe. So can we speak about Islamic enlightenment? Is what we see, uh, uh, can you call it enlightenment? We can talk about two moments as I said, if you look at the, what is enlightenment for the Frankfurt School, yes, the beginning of the 18th century and the uh, aberration of totalitarian times. So we can compare it to two moments, the global jihadism that we experience today with their total totalitarian view of the world with all the uh, adjacent violence and modernist Salafism, that Salafism of the late, of the intellectuals of late 19th century. Short, is there connection <coughs> between Daesh, and this is really looks like the Einsatzgruppen, uh, um, and intellectuals like Rashid Rida, yes, who sat at his study, uh, was editor of a ma very important magazine, Islamic magazine, and thought about all kinds of ideas about democracy, about freedom. Yeah? And I see in it a dual mo movement that I will try to uh, explain. Well, because if you remember, my title is the dual uh, dialectics. So one is to try to explain the movement from reason back to barbarity. The other is from selective westernization, taking from the West, what is good and allowed from Islamic point of view, to uh, total anti-Westernism that we have today. So what uh, characterized modern Salafism? Uh, Professor Rubin uh, mentioned my last book, Biography of Abdurrahman al-Kawakibi, in my view, one of the most important thinkers of the late 19th century, uh, Islamic thinkers, and this is the guy and well, he and many of his thought were first of all uh, motivated in responding to the 
the domination of the West uh, in the 19th century over the Arab world, uh, over the Ottoman Empire. But they saw much of Westernization, not directly, but also through the eyes of the modernization of the state. How the state, the Ottoman state, implemented the, uh, the reforms, Western-inspired reforms. And uh, the modernist Salafism combined yes, enlightenment with Renaissance, the Nahada, with uh, reformation, Islamic reform, and like enlightenment, uh, like the general enlightenment, they uh, taught about and called for liberation from religious tradition and from the political despotism of the Ottoman Sultan. They also spoke about liberation from tradition. Yeah? Uh, they had the myths. This is why they are called Salafis. The myth was a return to the model of the Salaf Salih, of the forefathers of Islam. But this was infused with new meanings. Yes, what was this model? Yeah. And it, it included the revival of uh, Arab culture and identity, the Nahada, and uh, it involved enlightenment proper. Because Kawakibi, it's unbelievable. I also uh, uh, published uh, the translation of his major work, Um al Qura, to uh, Hebrew, and it speaks an Islamic thinkers from the late 19th century about freedom, about the fight against tyranny, about the importance of science, and not only technology, but also political science and so social sciences and humanities. He was a humanist. He believed in democracy and fought for it. He also accepted many principles of socialism, proto-nationalism, and what might be the most surprising, he even supported separation of religion and state. He was a secularist in one of the definitions of secularism. This is a man of the Islamic enlightenment. But then came the catastrophe. And well, there are people like Kawakibi throughout the 20th century. Always there have been some. But there is a small group of intellectuals with not much influence. Well, there was a catastrophe. And the catastrophe was more than one with the, uh, 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 first of all, the European model collapsed when the French and the German and British slaughtered its, each other during the war. The Ottoman Empire was uh, disintegrated. The Arab world was divided between the colonial powers and the caliphate was abolished. This was a great shock for the Islamic reformers, Sykes-Picot, as the symbol of this catastrophe. And what happened in the uh, Salafist uh, camp was a split between, on one side, Salafis that drew to, uh, closer to the Wahhabis of Saudi Arabia, the only major state that remained independent, and on the other hand, the Muslim Brothers who retained the modernist part of Salafism, but went to political activism. So Wahhabi Salafism, to make it short, yes, the alliance with the Saudi state and the Wahhabi, the ultra-conservative Wahhabi sect of Saudi Arabia, which believes in, well, it's a Puritan, which reminds, of course, of the Protestant revolution, uh, Puritan, purity of uh, faith, the Tawhid, and purity of action, how to pray, how to dress, this. They continue to rely on the sources, but in very literalist and narrow interpretation. Uh, along with it, they are loyal. Uh, they became very loyal. There is alliance between the religious and political authority and the Wahhabi ulama are loyal, completely loyal to the government, to the ruling family, to the point, for example, of approving the, pre the peace uh, uh, initiative of uh, King Fahed and things like that. Yeah? But on the other hand, completely 
disavowal of Westerners. No contacts with Westerners. Completely segregation, which of course brings a contradiction because they support the state. And the state, the Saudi state, modernized. On the other hand, yes, uh, they were against any contact with this. In principle, they were, uh, they focused on internal things. The government decided about relations with the West. Ibn Baz, the main figure of this uh, mystery. On the other hand, the Muslim Brothers, it's a social movement modern type social movement, which seeks to establish an Islamic order. Uh, its principles are dawah, preaching Islam, and self-sacrifice under the dawah. Uh, unlike the Wahhabis, the Salafi Wahhabis, Muslim Brothers uh, approach is very ecumenical. They accept all groups of Islam. They emphasize uh, Islam and politis, politics, Islam encompasses everything, and we come to the West, condemnation of the West because it is materialist. Remember Frankfurt School, the separation between culture and material. Uh, Islamists do it as a separation between material West, materialist West, and the spiritual Islam or the East. So here, again, we have self-contradictions concerning the West, because Muslim Brothers employ uh, modern ideas, modern institutions, modern ways of ac action. Uh, they can accept, for example, democracy, as we saw in the so-called Arab Spring, but they are also geared against, uh, uh, in struggle against Western colonialism. Hassan al-Banna, the founder, yeah, you can see the tie and the tabush in between. Catastrophe two, what happened in the 30s uh, in Europe, divided into two catastrophes in the, uh, for the Islamists in the Arab world. And the catastrophe two was the rise of uh, Arab totalitarianism. Yeah? Uh, the post-colonial dictatorships, when army officers, Nasser, the Ba'as, uh, Assad, Saddam Hussein, all the good guys, uh, took over the government and they instituted dictatorship, but also promoted secular ideologies of nationalism and socialism. The Muslim brothers were not against nationalism and socialism, but they, so they didn't agree that these are above Islam. They determined Islam should regulate and not these secular ideologies. And what was worse for them, there was uh, Nasser and the Ba'as initiated very harsh persecution against them, imprisoning, uh, torturing, hanging, and exiling the Muslim brothers. Yes, Nasser as its hate. Yeah. This second catastrophe brought to radicalization. Radicalization uh, was, um, uh, well, uh, appeared in the manifesto by Said Qutub also translated to Hebrew. And this is, it's called signposts. Signposts, now no more Islamic movement, but avant-garde, yes? a, a small group that can lead the struggle under these circumstances. Kotob, I suppose, as some of you know, uh, he declared that the world returned to the age of Jahiliya, of pre-Islam, uh, pre pre-Islamic period, the end of the, the era of barbarity, and he divided the world into uh, Islamic uh, world, which is very, very small, almost nothing remained, and the uh, un-Islamic societies, un-Islamic world, where not only it includes Westerners, but also Muslims that don't follow the teachings of Said Qutb and his like. Yeah? And his main uh, innovation was the jihad begins against Muslims, Muslim infidels. The West will come, but after. First internal war, rebellion against uh, Muslim. But the West is behind the cor corner, never forgotten. Yeah, I didn't forget the uh, yeah. uh, The West is not forgotten, and he says Islamic, uh, the 
West uh, is on the brink of the abyss, is degenerated, corrupted, and it's, it's time for Islam to again lead the world. Yeah? If we think about in the contradiction here, again, all these groups are in problems in theological <coughs> terms. So uh, Kutub says explicitly, we must embrace the modern sciences, the technologies, but here he doesn't think anymore about uh, social sciences or uh, humanities, but of technologi technology and natural sciences, yes, without the Western spirit. Yeah. Said Kutub. As we know from social movement uh, approach, uh, grievances are not enough to make a change. There must be also opportunities. And the opportunities came uh, in the 80s and in the 90s through a uh, series of wars. The first of them, well, first I, I should say, yes, this was uh, recombined, allowed uh, a new meeting ground for Wahhabi Salafis, the ultra conservatives, with the hatred of the West, and radicalized Muslim brothers or Islamists, yeah, the, uh, which hated the West. They meet again together, uh, especially on the battlefield. And the first was the war in Afghanistan, 1979, the uh, Soviet invasion, the 80s, the organization. And there uh, emerges the theory of transnational jihad uh, by Abdal Azam, a Palestinian, uh, who organized the fight, the, the foreign fighters in Afghanistan, the Arab fighters. And he said that if one country, one Muslim country is attacked, all Muslims from all the world must come and uh, participate in this defensive jihad. Abdal Azam. Next, in 1990, uh, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and the Saudis were afraid that he was going to invade also to Saudi Arabia, they invited the Americans to come and help their defense. This enraged bin Laden, who offered his services, and was the uh, occasion for the uh, consolidation of Al-Qaeda, and uh, if uh, Azam is transnational jihad, with uh, Al-Qaeda, we can speak about global jihad. This is now uh, uh, a total war uh, uh, that it's not only uh, uh, defend, waiting for defense in uh, Muslim lands, waiting for attack, but attacking in the West. The, they call it the head of the snake, United States, the big Satan, and of course we also are within, as the small sultan, at least we are small, yeah. uh, Al-Qaeda. And the third, the third war uh, is the American invasion of Iraq in 2003, then followed 10 years later by the uh, civil war in uh, Syria. And here, we, I, I call it, uh, well, uh, I suggest to call it the media uh, jihad from the Islamic State, Islamic State first in Iraq, and then in Iraq and uh, Sham in Syria. And this is media because these atrocities are all uh, made before the cameras and are uh, uh, broadcasted immediately. And the effect, yes, what the Nazis did, uh, that it was the age of industry. So it was the it was industrial uh, uh, operation. Now we are in the age, of, the age of communications. So yes, beheading one or a small group makes effects as a much, uh, much bigger uh, for the whole population. And this is ISIS, yeah? the wars that really gave the Islamists the opportunities to develop the radical teachings, their hatred to the West. And as you see in stages, it reaches to the end. So, but there were also other set of opportunities. Uh, I'm very careful here because as I said, I, I'm not, I don't specialize on European uh, Islam, but I think, again, opportunities are very important. Uh, Brilliances are not enough. And I think that Europe 
uh, gave, uh, if, if America gave opportunities in its, fight, in its stupid wars in, uh, in the Muslim world, so uh, Europe gave other opportunities on its own soil. And well, it started in the 50s, 60s, when Muslim brothers, uh, many Muslim brothers were exiled, were political refugees, and they were accepted as such in European countries. And so the Muslim brothers, brotherhood establishes itself in Europe. A yeah. uh, little bit later on, from the 1670s, Saudi Arabia, especially after the oil boom of 73, uh, started to proselytize its Wahhabi, Salafi Wahhabi type of uh, Islam throughout the world, including in Europe, especially through the Muslim World League organizations. It did today has a, a full building, not just office in London, but in many other places. And this brought to the spread of Salafism in, in Europe. Okay. Uh, not th these are not necessarily the radical Muslim brothers, yes? It's more the dawah, the proselytizing, all the time, usually. Also the Salafis, most of them are not radical. They are just Puritans. Yeah? They, they focus on the purity of religion. But it also gave ample opportunity for the Salafi jihadists, for the radicals, because of the uh, ideals of Europe, and it took time to understand what is going on uh, and the freedom of movement throughout Europe and within each country, freedom of speech, the freedom uh, to preach in the mosques, especially in Londonistan, really the capital of all these activities. All this brought Salafi jihadism in, uh, in Europe. So, and many, yeah, many of the uh, uh, theologians and ideologues of Salafi <coughs> jihadism those who promoted global terror you know, were located in Europe and from there could spread their, uh, their teachings. Yeah. So uh, if we come now to ISIS, yeah, so it's very interesting. Uh, we became aware of ISIS uh, on 29th June 2014 uh, when uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi uh, proclaimed himself as caliph of all Muslims. And this was exactly 100 years and one day after the assassination of the uh, apparent heir, uh, Ferdinand, in Sarajevo. And this is what ISIS wants to do. It wants to erase these 100 years that started with World War I and uh, was embodied in the Sykes-Picot agreement. Yeah? So this is erasing 100 years of European or Western influence in the Middle East. Yeah? They want to restore the universal caliphate. Um, if Wahhabis want to, uh, or Salafis want to uh, institute the uh, return to the scriptures, or literal institution of the, of the scripture, of the Quran, literal interpretation of the Quran, they want to institute the Sharia, including uh, slavery, including uh, killing of prisoners, and all the uh, uh, abuses that we, uh, that we see. Unbridled violence, there's no limit to this violence, and it's universal caliphate. The aim, they have state in Iraq and Syria, they already have states, Nigeria, in a way, Libya, other places, but the real aim is to conquer the West, the entire, to turn all history around. Yes, and this is, Dabik is the magazine, we can find it on, on the web. Uh, it is also messianic. Uh, Dabik is where, is the uh, um, valley where the last war will be before the coming of the Mahdi, yes? And this is Rome with the flag of ISIS on it. Yeah? This is total war against the East. Now, uh, the question is, uh, uh, is it really, does this uh, uh, attempt to see all these developments, um, 
again, again can really be helped by the dialectic, this theory of, of the dialectics of enlightenment. Is it really dialectics of Islamic the, the enlightenment? Does it really come from the teachings of the early Salafis, the early modernist uh, Salafis in some way? And uh, uh, does it help us? For this, we have to maybe got it back. Uh, I just uh, want to emphasize, yeah. Well, okay, is it really dialectics of Islamic in line? Is it, uh, uh, is it supports uh, our explanations? Well, I believe, and uh, well, I can tell a secret that uh, Uya is continuing to writing and already sent me a new manuscript of a new book about these, exactly the early uh, modernist Salafis, and they were really believed in enlightenment. Their ideas were of freedom, of democracy, of liberty, of uh, progress. And of course, I don't blame them for what is happening now, as we cannot uh, uh, blame Rousseau or Kant for, uh, for the Nazis, yes? But they lived in a chaos, the world they lived in. It was the change the, when tradition was discredited the world was chaos, and they needed myth. And this myth was the myth of the Salaf, the, uh, the forefathers of Islam. And with the catastrophe of World War I, when uh, uh, European example uh, failed them, yeah, they felt alienated. There were no more Muslims like before, but they were also not Westerners. Yeah? They were alienated to themselves. They were alienated to the West. And therefore, they wanted to take from the West the material, uh, material achievements, but still retain their own Islamic, uh, uh, Islamic spirit, Islamic culture. But because they didn't have one anymore, not the traditional one, the myth grew and grew, and uh, new interpretation ca came in. And as the dissonance was greater, so also the myth became more and more a primitive one, a myth of violence, a myth of barbarity, and that's what we see now with, uh, first with Al-Qaeda, and now with ISIS, when uh, Islam, turns, well, this Islamic enlightenment from in its, within itself turns into barbarity. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm afraid no questions. We don't have time for questions. Uh, 